Hello, it's Stephen Pinecker from Mormon Book Reviews. No, you're not. Actually, this is Stephen Pinecker of Mormon Book Reviews. Welcome, Welcome to, to Gospel, Gospel Tangents, Tangents, your best source for Mormon history, science, and theology. Good job. I'm Rick Bennett. I'm excited to have Paul Toscano back on the show. We're going to shift gears and we're going to talk about the Mark Hoffman bombings. And I was surprised to find out that Paul knew Steve Christensen really well. Of course, Steve was unfortunately killed in that October 1985 pipe bomb attack by Mark Hoffman. And so Paul will share his memories of Steve, his interactions with the police, and those sorts of things. So you won't want to miss this conversation. Check it out. So let's switch gears, Paul. I'd like to talk a little bit about the Mark Hoffman situation. I understand that you knew uh, one of the murder victims very well. Yes. Um, Steve Christensen, right? Correct. And so tell us how you knew Steve and, and became involved with, I think it was CFS, right? Correct. What happened was that uh, I started my law practice in Orem in a four-man firm with Rick Jackman. Uh, and then in uh, about 1983, at the end of 83, I was hired to be the judicial clerk for the only bankruptcy judge, Glenn Clark, who's passed away now, but he was the bankruptcy judge. It's a federal position. It's a federal bankruptcy court. And I, I, I worked there. I was hired there uh, actually on December 31st, 1983. And worked there right through um, March 31st of 1985. So I worked all of 84 and the first few months of 1985. And I remember it because I got a job... Um, at CFS Corporation, where Gary Sheets was the head guy, and Steve Christensen was his right-hand man. So Gary was the president, and Steve was the vice president of CFS. And I became uh, a member, I, I was in-house counsel, so I was hired to work as a corporate well, member of the corporation with five other lawyers. And the business of CFS Corporation was to purchase property all over the country, but mostly in Texas and Utah. And they would buy apartment complexes, and then they would create a limited partnership. And, the, and CFS, would, CFS Corporation would be the general partner and manage the limited partnership. And a, and a general partner is liable for the problems of the partnership, but the limited partners are limited in the sense their liability is limited. They're not going to be held liable for anything. But back then, the reason why these were structured was the tax code would allow these limited partners to take the losses of the limited partnership and list the losses on their tax returns and that would lower their taxes. So they would take advantage of the losses. Well, the problem with that idea is that nobody kept up the apartment building because you wanted them to depreciate. And they didn't, do, they didn't fix them up and add improvements. So over time, they were just banking on the depreciation and the value. And that depreciation would have a numerical number of dollar amount of depreciation, which then could be applied to the limited partners tax returns, and it was a mechanism by which rich people could lower their taxes by becoming limited partners. But we were the general partner. We were liable and uh, for any problems, and uh, the management was being done by our uh, company, which had a lot of employees working on different aspects of managing these apartment buildings. And I was hired to be uh, the, um, one of the lawyers. And uh, because of my bankruptcy experience. And because some of the partners... Were they already in trouble when they hired you? Well, some of the limited partnerships were thinking about filing bankruptcy in Texas, for example, or other places. It, it wasn't the company, but the limited partnership that might take out bankruptcy in order to rehabilitate itself and get back on a proper footing. 
get more investment in there to fix the building up and that way they could have more tenants and they, their revenues would exceed their expenses so that they would be profitable again. But sometimes you'd have to take them through bankruptcy for that to happen. So it was just a strategy that could be used. Anyway, what has this to do with Mark Hoffman? Well, St Steve Christensen was the vice president of that company. I became friends with him. We weren't socially, uh, we didn't have social contact, but uh, we talk about religion. He was a bishop. And in about, in April of 1985, uh, he, uh, this was at a time when Hoffman was doing all of his forgeries. And one of the principal forgeries that he had done that was not known yet to be a forgery was the Salamander letter, which was purportedly a letter, I think, from Martin Harris, I think, to Joseph Smith or to somebody, where he gave it. Martin Harris allegedly gives, um, uh, recounts Joseph Smith's first vision where rather than going to the Hill Cumorah and seeing an angel, he goes to the Hill Cumorah and sees a salamander appear in a fiery kind of way. Uh, and this was so disturbing. And turns into an angel. And turns into an angel. And I hate when that happens. <laughs> <laughs> but I'd rather it be that than the other way. <laughs> and uh, anyway, this was in the letter. Well... This became very controversial, and and Hoffman's was not known then to be a forger. He was known to be a, a, a document collector, and he, he had a, a wide range of uh, contacts around the country. He was finding things all over, you know, like the Oath of a Freeman, which was the first printed document, I think, in the United States. It was very valuable, something like that. I, I can't remember very well. But um, then he was finding all kinds of Mormon doctrines, Joseph Smith's blessing of his son, Joseph Smith III, or finding these documents that were very valuable and uh, to the churches. But made to order. Made, more or less, <laughs> made to order. They were suspiciously on point. <laughs> In any case, uh, Steve Christensen had made several um, full-color, blown-up, copies of the salamander letter because he he had purchased it from hoffman and he was planning on donating it to the church but he didn't want the church to have the one and only copy because he felt they would hide it and so he gave me a copy and he gave another fellow that worked at the cfs a copy and frankly, I can't find mine. So if anybody's going to try to break in my house and find it, it, you know, I think George Throckmorton gave me a, a copy. So. Good, well, you can get the, you can <laughs> steal it from Rick. <laughs> but I can't find mine. But um, he gave that to me, and and because we had become friends, and he told me in confidence that he was having a faith crisis. And I said, well, maybe. <clears throat> Maybe there's a historical basis for the Book of Mormon. It was a Book of Mormon faith crisis because, you know, we can't seem to find any uh, adequate physical evidence of the historicity of the Book of Mormon. Well, and I'm sure Mark was feeding him a lot of stuff that was causing that faith crisis too. I believe that might be true. And I said, well, I, I have a story that is in the other direction. It may be helpful to you. I don't know, and I told him this story. And uh, the story I told him had been told by me, uh, not by me, no, no. It had been told to me by a close friend of mine. Uh, this friend, whose name I will attempt to not say, <laughs> but it was a he, he went on a mission <laughs> to England in the 70s. And I think he got back in 76 or 77. Uh, and when he got back, one of the, he, he landed, he, he lives in Florida, but he, he came out to Salt Lake. He was fairly well healed. So a flight to Salt Lake was not that burdensome on him. 
And he, he came to Salt Lake, I think specifically to talk to me, to tell me the story. Because I, 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 at BYU, when I was for the 15 years I was with BYU, people came to understand that I was very interested in Mormon doctrine and theology, and they thought I knew something. So he wanted to share this with me. So he did. He came to my apartment. I was single, and we went into my bedroom, and he sat in the chair, and I sat on the bed, and I said, well, what is it? I wasn't expecting what he told me at all. And what he said was that well, while he was in the mission field in England, he was, he was a zone leader in the area where the Bath is located, the city of Bath, England. in the England, which is in the United Kingdom. <laughs> and Britain is not England. England is one of the four. Okay. <laughs> There's England, Wales, Scotland, and Ireland, Northern Ireland. And that makes the United Kingdom. But he was in, in England, and the city of Bath is in England. And he wanted, he said, while I was, while he was there, uh, he said two, there were two missionaries who were tracting, and they tracted out this person whose name was Fuchs. And when he came to, the, the Fuchs came to the door, it wasn't, it, wasn't, it wasn't my friend, but it was two missionaries that my friend supervised. He said, they came to the door, they gave their door approach, and he said, I know, I know you, I know your church, I have something that uh, has been put in trust for me that I have for you and your church. Come on in. He claimed that the scripture they quoted to him was one that he was told to be look out for. He said his father had gotten these items and put them with his son in trust. And, and um, so he goes, he invites the two missionaries in, he goes, away for a bit and he comes back and he brings out the gold plates and they're two, you know, um, two thirds of them are tied up in leather straps and thongs and one third is free and they're thin gold plates on which had been inscribed all of these strange characters and there was a hilt of a sword that had jewelry in it and there was a, the, uh, a Urim and Thummim. It was in a silver bow, and there were two crystals in it. And he brought them out and showed, well, the uh, two missionaries were absolutely astounded. They uh, called their mission president, which is the right thing to do. And the mission president came and talked to Fuchs, and Fuchs told him, and the mission president eventually told this to my friend who was the zone leader, so that's how my friend learned about it. But I think this is correct. I'm, I'm, it's a long time ago. It's 30 years ago. It was in the 70s that I remembered the story. 40 years ago. 40 years ago. So it's hard. To, but I think, I'm not quite sure how my friend got to know this last part, but he did. I get to know it. That uh, what happened was that this contact that they, who had these artifacts, his father was an archaeologist. This is going to sound like straight out of Indiana Jones. His, in South America. And he had been among Indians uh, of some kind down there. Uh, I, I don't know what to call them. I call them Indians because I don't know what their tribe was anymore. Uh, maybe it was the Maya. Maybe it was something else. But this was back in the 30s. And he, they entrusted him, these indigenous people, entrusted this archaeologist with these artifacts because they had a prophecy that said what, that they should give them up to somebody who looked like him and they told him that he should turn them over to whoever had this say these words. Well, he was a German and this was in the 30s and he was living in Germany and Hitler had, was, had come to power. So when he went back, he brought the artifacts back but he was afraid, well, I think it was before Hitler came to power, so it was in the 20s, and then when Hitler came to power, he was afraid that they, they find the gold, they would melt it down or they would take it. So he had, a, he had developed a, some property in England earlier on, and he, he managed to get these artifacts out of Germany so that the Nazis wouldn't get them. And and that's how they wound up in England, and eventually he died, and his son, the Fuchs Jr., was there, and he turned him over to the mission president. Well, the mission president took the Urim and Thummim and the hilt of the sword, 
and took that with him. But then he sent my friend to collect, and his companion, I think, but I can't remember that, to collect the gold plates. Apparently he felt like if he got ambushed by anybody, he would not be strong enough to maybe beat them off so maybe these younger guys could be custodians until they got this, the gold plate. And then he called Saul Leg and tells them, and of course... Uh, Eldon Tanner was in the first presidency then, went out, and a guy by the name of Chessman, who was a religion professor, I can't remember his first name. It, it won't come to me. <laughs> he went, and some others went, and they examined these things, and their main problem was to get them to the United States. Well, they couldn't get them through customs. So I think they had a, I think the story that I recall, and it may be wrong, uh, but it's the only story I have. It's not like I'm choosing among stories. What I heard was that they, they, uh, they put it into the wall of a yacht or something, and that sailed across the Atlantic to Canada, oh, wow. and then they took it across Canada to, because it's a Commonwealth country and they have relaxed rules about uh, <laughs> ancient artifacts. Well, about going through customs and things, and so they got it. They smuggled it into Canada, and then they smuggled it. To, they got it to Alberta, Calgary or something, and then they, in a private plane, got to, to Salt Lake. Anyway, it gets to the leaders of the church. And and that's what Greg... Greg told me that that, that much of it. He, he knew that much, that they got it to the United States. And that was it. Well, I thought, well, about the same time that... He, about a year earlier than he tells me this story, I heard a rumor at BYU that N. Eldon Tanner's daughter said that when he came home, because he was living with, I think it was with his daughter, he said, well, now that we have the Urim and Thummim, I wonder what we're going to do with it. So I had heard that rumor before uh, before this fellow came and Thomas said his name, before he came and told me the story. So I, I, kept, I just thought, well, maybe they have it. Who knows? The first person has it in the vault. Has it in has its the vault. Actual gold plate, has the actual gold plates to your and, and the sword. hilt of the sword of Laban. I thought, well, that, that, would, that would change the story a little if we actually had it. <laughs> and so, because, so in 1985, in April, when Steve Christensen told me he has a faith crisis, I, I said, well maybe there is a historical artifacts because I told him the story. Well, he wrote it down in his journal. He didn't tell anybody, but he, I asked him to keep it confidential because the friend who told me asked me to keep it confidential because he was told to keep it confidential. So I told Steve to keep it confidential. That's how we pass rumors on in the church by swearing everybody to confidentiality, but you don't keep it sometimes. Well, I, I didn't want it you know, I told Steve because he looked like he was having serious spiritual crisis. I said, so maybe there is a basis. So he wrote it down in his journal, apparently, because after he was killed, he was killed on October the 15th, the morning of October the 15th of 1985. This is eight years before I'm excommunicated. So he he's... Uh, that morning that he's killed, I'm I'm at home with the flu. I, or I had a bad cold or something. I, I was sick as a dog. And uh, my sister-in-law was also a lawyer for CFS. And she had gone to work that morning. And she had heard right away that Steve had been killed. I hadn't heard the news. She called me on the phone. It was about 8 in the morning and she says Paul she was in tears and she said Steve Christensen has been killed I said my god what happened and she said a bomb went off in the judge building I said a bomb what's going on and she says we think it's a a disgruntled investor of CFS because CFS was going underwater now how let me just digress just briefly uh, to say that as a lawyer I, I, I was the one who wrote the memo that said that we had to that CFS as a general partner of the limited partnerships had to withdraw because it was insolvent because Arthur Anderson, our accountants, had issued a statement saying that CFS Financial Corporation was insolvent 
on some, you know, there's a way of testing insolvency, but uh, the, on one of those or both of those tests, the standard ones, they said we were insolvent. So as soon as I got that information, I knew that we had to withdraw as general partner to all of these limited partnerships which means that CFS would no longer be getting the fees for managing those partnerships and that therefore we're going to go deeper into trouble. So I issued the memo saying, you know, there's no, we have a legal obligation to find another general partner for these partnerships, but we have to get out. We can wind up, but we have to get out right away. We have to start the process. Well, Gary Sheets didn't want to hear that. So he went off to play the video games at the arcade around the corner because he was, I would say, crazy, but he just couldn't cope. And Steve Christensen could, uh, well, he could have, but he had left CFS and had moved over to the judge building to become a stockbroker with a, his own partner that he had there. So he was. So he was trying to get out of CFS. He had already left CFS. Oh, oh okay. So I couldn't talk to Steve. He was, well, he was dead, but I, if, I couldn't have talked to Steve about the problem because as soon as we knew the problem, well, I, when we found out that CFS was, had to withdraw from the limited partnerships, Steve tried to convince Gary to take very serious measures to maybe save the company, but he neither could convince him nor could they find a way. So that's when Steve left. So that was in s September of 1985 and then by October he had he had moved out he had quit and the company was falling apart and we were trying to hold it together to see what we could do and then on October 15th he, he Steve was killed by this bomb and I get this call because I'm sick at home well that morning at about 11 Kathy Sheets Gary Sheets' wife goes out from her house and sees a package in her driveway and goes to pick it up, and that's the other bomb that went off on October the 15th and killed Kathy Sheet, totally innocent, lovely person. And when that happened, I got another call from Ellen. She called me about that because I wasn't watching the news. We didn't have the internet or telephones to be constantly watching the news as we do now. She called me and said Kathy Sheets had been killed. And she was, uh, my sister-in-law was quite convinced that it was because there was this disgruntled investor blowing up CFS people because they'd lost their money. And she said, you better check under your car to see if there's a bomb. I said, well, I don't know if anybody would know where I live. She said, Paul, just take precautions. So I called, I was living in Taylorsville, and I called the Taylorsville police about 11 o'clock. And I said, you know, I, I'm a lawyer with CFS. Two bombs have gone off. We think it's a disgruntled adventure. I've parked my, I didn't park my car in the garage. It's parked on the curb. Uh, I wonder if you'd Check my car for me. Check my car. I feel embarrassed. And he says, sure. So this police officer comes by by himself. And he comes to the door and knocks. And I say, yeah, I'm sorry to put you. He said, Mr. Toscano, I'll check under your car. But it it's not, has nothing to do with the, the CFS company. He says, we know that it has to do with the salamander letter. Huh. So... I, I knew that the police believed that... We're in trouble fast then, right? Well, I don't... Because it's 9 a.m. that the first bomb goes off. It's 11 a.m. when the second bomb goes off. The police in Taylorsville were already alerted to the fact that it wasn't... How did they know it? How did this policeman know it? I'm not making this up. I'm not getting my dates wrong. I made notes on this. I... I could, you know, and then the leaders of the church are, well, we don't know what's going on and what could it be, and everybody's wondering who the bomber is. They knew that it was probably Hoffman. But you got to understand that I think they knew more. I think that they, I think Steve put himself in danger by 
taking Gordon B. Hingley's calling, private calling, to keep an eye on on Hoffman. Yeah, could you tell us more and, about and, that? Because you said Steve Christensen was asked. Yeah, Steve to spy Christensen on was Hoffman, asked. Basically, in fact, on the night before Steve Christensen was killed, he was killed on October the fifteenth at around eight. On October the fourteenth, at around six, he came to my office. He he was no Steve longer did. he was no longer working at CFS. Right. He was coming from the judge building around the corner, down actually down the street, from the old R box building where CFS was located. And he came to my office. He said, "I need to speak to a spiritual counselor." And I said, "Well, I, you're the bishop. I, I'm I'm not." I'm not a spiritual count. He said, well, I've got, I've got to ask you what you would do under... And he started to tell me. And the phone rang behind me. I'm pointing to where the phone was, the credenza. And uh, he... Um, the phone rang, and it was uh, our local council in Texas who had bankruptcy questions for me about one of the... Par- and Steve says, oh, just take the call. I said, well, no, I'll call back. He says, "No, no, I'll, I'll I'll talk to you tomorrow." So there, I never never talked to him again. I never talked to him again. Wow. But I think he, now that I think about it, you know, years after thinking about it, I think he was going to tell me about this problem with uh, Hoffman, his suspicions that they were forgeries. So, so Steve had been asked to kind of keep an eye on. He, he got a special setting apart and blessing from Gordon B. Hinckley to do because that. the church was concerned about that these were forgeries. Yeah, they wanted to keep their distance from it. Yeah, they wanted to buy them whether they're forgeries or authentic. If there were forgeries, they didn't want them circulating. If they were authentic, they didn't want them circulating <laughs> because they were authentic. Huh. Because everybody up to that point had just assumed that everything was authentic. Yeah. But Steve, I think, felt like something was wrong with Hoffman and that maybe they were forgeries. I think he thought that. Steve was starting to suspect. I think he, well, why would Hoffman kill him? Something was wrong. Hoffman knew that Steve's... Well, I mean, at that time, I know the McClellan collection was due. Yeah, and maybe Steve thought that the McClellan... McClellan... I can't say it. McClellan collection... Boy, that's... Was, didn't exist. Well, well didn't. Gordon B. Hinckley knew that whatever the McClellan collection was, they already had it in the vault. So Gordon Hinckley must have known... Well, because I've heard that they didn't know that they had the McClellan collection. Well, I think that's bull. Oh, really? Yeah, they the historians knew what they had. They had inventoried this stuff. I think that. Well, that's not what I hear. They well, I think that's, that's what they. Bad record keeping. I have a feeling. My. I don't think it's my belief. My fear. Is that they were trying to catch, Hoffman. So that when he offered them the McClellan collection. And he never had it, but he might have described it. The fact that they already had it was a red flag to them because they began to think that Hoffman was the con man selling them something they already had possession of. And maybe that triggered or was part of the reason they put Steve Christensen... So this was a trap? I believe that Hoffman believed that it was... I believe he believed he had to kill Steve Christensen for some reason. Why would you think he had to kill Steve Christensen? What's going on? Well, I, I mean, think the reason that they normally give is that there was a payment due that he couldn't make. Right. But why would he kill Steve? Why wouldn't he borrow the money from him? Or ask for a bridge loan? Or get him to secure a loan from the bank? Why would he blow him up? Had he asked him for all of those things and those things were turned down by Steve? Would Steve have done that without reporting that to Gordon B. Hinckley? How did the police know? Where did they learn about the Salamander letter by 11 o'clock on the morning of October the 15th if the leaders of the church hadn't informed the police of what was going on? Hmm. I've always wondered about all of that. It seems like pretty soft, not a firm 
the explanations I hear don't account for some of these anomalies that I'm aware of. But I'm not, I wasn't, you know, I was kind of on the periphery. But, you know, when sometimes when you're on the periphery, you, you see things. <laughs> if you knew Steve, you were really close. <laughs> I yeah. wasn't about periphery, but. But I was on on the periphery of the investigation. I wasn't, you know, like Brent Metcalf was or. Brent or, Ashworth. Brent Ashworth or the fellow who died recently. I never knew him, but he. Al Rust. Well, Al Rust, no, I never knew him, but he, this fellow. Oh, Shannon Flynn. Shannon Flynn. Touch my microphone, I shouldn't. Um, yeah, Shannon Flynn, who seemed always to be a little bit too dramatic, but I think probably told the truth in his dramatic way. I'm a little bit dramatic, but not quite the same as Fanny. So, um, yeah, so that what happened then was that when the book Salamander was being written by Linda Silito and Alan Roberts, they got permission from Steve Christensen's widow to read his journals. And when they read his journal, they read the entry that he made in March of 1985, where he had said that I had told him this story about the gold plates. Right. And so they called me up on the phone as they're preparing the book, and they said, did you tell him this? And I said, how did you... How, how did you know that? How do you... What are you... Ask, where did you... What's going on? They said, well, we got his journal and we read it and he put it in his journal. Did you actually tell him that? And I said, yes, I did. And they said, well, why? And I said, well, because it was told to me by the person to whom it happened. And they said, well, will you tell us more? Can you tell us his name and tell us other things? Because I didn't maybe tell it as details as I did today when I was talking to you. And so they said, I said, well, I got to call him. So I called him, and he said, he, well, first I said, well, I, I don't know what this has to do with anything. I mean, what, what, what would this have to do with Mark Hoffman? The fact that this happened in England and this is told to me and I tell it to, what has this to do with your investigation about Mark Hoffman? They said, well, did you know that Mark Hoffman served his, his, his mission in England? I said, no. He said, do you know that he served in Bath? And, I and said, this took place in Bath. Yeah, and this, this, yeah the, that's right. Lived in Bath or near there. Right. And I said, no. And I said, but I'm beginning to see that there might be a connection. He said, did, we, we interviewed one of Mark Hoffman's missionary companions who went with him in England was in Bath. And that he would, he would leave his com companion to go off by himself. And the companion also reported that he had developed a kind of relationship with the custodian of the library in Bath, and that they had read somewhere that the people of Bath in the 19th century had created a false set of gold plates that they were going to use to, to uh, as a prank, to prank the missionaries or the church or something. I, that part I never, never registered because the way it was described, it would have been a lot of work to create this right. artifact, but apparently they had, no, they had time on their hands, oh. and they did it. So they said, we, we're just trying to check this out to see if Mark had anything to do with this. I said, well, you've met the standard of probable cause, so I'm going to call my friend. <laughs> So I called him, and he, when I told him, he was slightly disappointed and then said, sure, let's find out. So I told them the whole story and told them about Nathan Tanner and told them about this Paul, Paul Chessman. It's the same name that I have. <laughs> he, he went down there, and, and uh, I told them the story. I said, but I'm going to follow up on this. Uh, so did I, was it then that I did it? I, it was then, it was then that I did it. I called, I tried to get a hold of Paul Chessman, who was a religion teacher at BYU, but he had retired, and he, and I was told that he'd retired, and I said, well, where is he? And naturally, he had retired to St. George, the place where old BYU religion preachers go to 
desiccate. <laughs> and so he, I call, I got somehow his daughter's number, and the, I called her, and then she told me he was down there, and I got his number. But he was, somebody was at his house, but he, they told me that he was in England leading a, some kind of a tour, I don't know. And so I said, well, do you have a number for him in, the, in England? And they said, yeah, and it, it was like two in the morning there. <laughs> I didn't care. I called him and got him out of bed. I said, this is Paul Toscano. He said, oh, what do you want? Because I wasn't excommunicated yet, but they, I, he knew who I was. And, and I, said, I, I said, you know what time it is here? I said, I don't care what time it is there. I, I want to know whether you were in England in the 70s when Fuchs delivered to the mission president the gold plates and the hilt of the sword of Laban and the Urim and Thummim. There was silence. He says, how do you know about that? I said, one of the missionaries that went to England told me about it. He said, well, that turned all, that's all lies. It was all false. I said, what do you mean it was all false? You mean there wasn't the... No, he says, there were the things, but it was all a con. It was all fake. He said the apparently the the gold plates weren't the real thing, and the the gems and the hilt of the story of Laban were glass, which I felt was the most ridiculous aspect of the forgery. <laughs> I mean, you have fake gems. I mean, they're fairly easy to check out. And the Urim and Thummim, it was fake. Uh, I assume because it didn't work or it didn't have real good crystals in it or whatever. And so I said, well, what happened? He said, well, Fuchs, uh, the, he went to Salt Lake and met with President Kimball, and he got baptized and got endowed, and then they found out that he was a fraud. So they excommunicated him, and he went back to England, and they took the stuff and just kept it in the vault, I guess. I don't know if that last part's true, but I don't think they discarded it because it's... It was too much fun? Well, I think they you know if they had been forgeries they keep them because they don't want them circulating and they don't want these things out there cuz you know, who knows what so i assume the church still has these somewhere but so uh i called my friend back and said this is the end of the story it's fake you know and he said oh I, oh well and uh that's the story of how that happened and got, and that's partially reported. A redacted version of that story is in the book Salamander by Linda Silito and Alan Roberts. But that was my my brush with the Hoffman case. So, uh, Strange but true. What were your thoughts? Uh, I mean, were you scared when these two bombs went off? Well. Yes, I'm cowardly. I was a little bit, but I wasn't shaking in my boots. I felt I was... You were far enough away. I was in Taylorsville, and, uh, you know, how many bombs can you make, and why would they blow me up? I, I was... I'm sorry. I was just following the law when I wrote my memo. I can't, I can't... You know, Arthur Anderson, they're the ones who said we were insolvent. Go blow them up. And I think eventually Arthur Anderson did blow up in a way. I mean, it went away. Oh, with Enron? <laughs> <laughs> yes, they they got caught doing bad things. And so, uh, yeah, I think um, it was a... It, it, and then, of course, he blew himself up, but right. he was on his way to deliver the bomb to somebody else. Yeah. And nobody knows who that was. I, I think it might have been uh, an attorney named Bradley. I, I can't... Oh, it wasn't Brent Ashworth? I don't think so. Oh, I don't think so, but what do I know? I mean, there people have investigated this. I mean, they had investigative qualifications, and I'm kind of standing on the periphery. When do we get, like, is there, are they going to open up all the files for the Hoffman case, or does he have to die first or something? So I thought they this? made a very bad deal. They should have, they should have made him, they should have gotten it out of him yeah. a long time ago, which I think they could have. They could have offered him something. 
but he never, I don't think he ever said anything, because I think he wants his forgeries to continue to do damage. I think they're out there. Well, there's that Emily Dickinson forgery that uh, Brent Ashworth talked about a decade later. Oh, that really? he identified, yeah. That, that uh, some auction house was trying, I think, was it Sotheby's? Anyway, some auction house was trying to sell it. What was Brent, it, a poem? It was a poem, it was an Emily Dickinson poem written by Mark Hoffman. But could you sing it to the Yellow Rose of Texas? Because <laughs> you can sing most of Emily Dickinson's poems to the Yellow Rose oh, of Texas. I don't know, I'll have to ask Brent. <laughs> <laughs> but Brent said when he saw it back in the 80s, he said it was the worst Emily Dickinson poem I'd ever seen. <laughs> I thought it was terrible. <laughs> yeah, well, so It's, you, well. But yeah, it was, it was a decade later. After Hoffman had been I'm in jail. I'm sure there are forgeries floating around that yeah. he doesn't want to admit to because he I, he was just very angry. I mean, where does it come from, you know? Sometimes people do things so bad, like the kid that killed the kids in Uvalde, Texas, you know. They shoot elementary school children. You have to ask yourself... You know, why? It's like demonic possession. I mean, it, there seems to be no rational explanation for... I'm not saying it is demonic possession. I'm just saying it, it, it's outside a normal person's frame of... You know, you, people get angry, people get hurt, but why, why, why rain, rain hell down on elementary school children and their parents what's the point you know I mean anyway it is very confusing as to what Mark did and he was very angry I mean I, I'll never forget the photograph of him showing some document to Spencer Kimball the president of the church and Eldon Tanner is there and Marion G. Romney is there and in the background lurking as usual is Boyd Packer and they're looking at this document and this was on the inside closet wall of his workshop down in the basement where he locked it up all the time and I don't think his, even, his wife even went down there but there was a closet when they opened it this was on the inside of the closet door and on it was this photograph from the newspaper was scribbled some profit so he delighted in in fooling people. Right. There's a there's a power in getting people. It's it's almost it's like a mental rape, where you 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 get in and you you know you've destroyed you've subverted their belief structure. It's extremely cruel. And. Uh, but on the other side, people can lie to maintain people's belief structure in something that isn't true. And and so, what it leads a person. That's why I say, I, Lord, I believe. Help them, my unbelief, because because I'm skeptical. I be, you know I believe in the efficacy of science, but I'm skeptical. I believe in the efficacy of mystical experiences, but I'm also skeptical. I believe that churches can do good and bad. I'm skeptical. I'm skeptical of the critics of of the church, and I'm skeptical of the apologists of the church. I'm skeptical. I don't mean that I... It's not an ad hominem attack. It's just that... Well, you're skeptical of angels. You told me that last time, too. Well, I am skeptical of angels. <laughs> it's not that I don't believe angels don't exist. I, I, I happen to think that you know, like I say, in a universe where if you take a pie chart and you have a little cutout and say, we we get we understand four percent and ninety six percent we haven't a clue. I don't think under those circumstances we can eliminate the possibility of angels. But you know, I think that churches and states are created not by God but by angels. Brigham Young said that. He said, you know, they they're created in order to keep people from slipping further into depravity but I think that these structures these institutional structures have become creatures of their own they demand attention they they have they come up with creeds and moralities that you have to follow they 
rules and regulations, sticks and carrots, and the leaders get benefits and that the members don't get. It doesn't matter whether it's the Republican Party, the Democratic Party, the Mormon Church, or the Catholic Church, whatever. This, this stratification happens and there's internal dissension, you know, and how do you overcome that? Well, I don't know. For me, I've withdrawn. I'm practically a recluse. I mean, I'm I'm doing this because I'm 77 and I don't have much time left and I wanted to leave a record. And people don't read. They, I've got 15 books. I know they haven't read them. <laughs> <laughs> so this might get my ideas out. Not because I think I'm right about everything. I'm skeptical of some of the things I say. I mean, I, I'm afraid that I may be wrong. You're skeptical I, of yourself? I think, I, I think I'm right. Nobody believes uh, that they're Nobody deliberately believes in something false, so I, I believe I'm correct, but I may be wrong, you know. Uh, I think that was the statement of Cromwell to the Parliament. He said, but the bowels of our Lord Jesus Christ, you may be wrong, he says to the long Parliament or something. And I say that to myself. I step out of myself and I say, you know, you, are, you believe in angels? Think you're going to say that on the thing? And yeah, I am, but I may be wrong. I, I don't like the idea of uh, scientific materialism because we we don't know enough to come to that conclusion that it's just m molecules. But maybe I but I could be wrong about that. It could just be that. Uh, I don't know. Maybe there is no life after death, or I hope I don't. I'd like to not only have my loved ones, but I'd like to meet some other people that I didn't get a chance to meet. You know. Very cool. Marilyn Monroe. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've kept you a long time. Is there well, anything else? Well, thank you. you. No, I, I... Well, one thing I'd like to say is I've written, an, I've written several novels, and the latest one is this called Driving Jesus. And uh, on the back it says, The risen Messiah must yet again appear on a roadway to a zealot named Paul, my character, this time to reverse a harebrained assassination plot concocted in God's name. <laughs> Sounds like the Hoffman thing. <laughs> it's, it's called Driving Jesus, a Testament of Miracles, Mystery, and Attempted Assassination. And it's, um, it's a kind of a lighthearted gospel. So I, I'm traveling. Jesus, uh, I'm on my way. I get down as far as Nephi and I have to pee. And... Uh, when I get back to the car, Jesus is in the passenger seat. He, he's, oh. he's appeared as about a 19-year-old kid, <laughs> and he's got bushy hair, and he wants, me, he wants to tag along on my ill-conceived and harebrained scheme or the, of my character, Paul. And uh, the first thing I have to do is pull over to the barbershop where he can get a haircut. He gets back in the car, he pulls down the the visor and flips up the vanity mirror and looks at him and says, how do I look? <laughs> I say, you look like a trust fund kid just getting out of Yale. <laughs> what is wrong with you? You're an old man. Why didn't you appear as an old man? So that starts our journey. And we have a bunch of adventures on the way. And my purpose in writing the book was to illuminate theology through a series of vignettes like it's done in the New Testament so it's kind of my very very late gospel <laughs> <laughs> and people can just get that on Amazon I guess I haven't actually published it yet what you're seeing here is a review copy it's ready to go I just haven't had the courage to push the button to make it available to everybody but probably I will soon okay by the time this is aired it will certainly be published I want to tell you that I enjoy doing these with you. You're very good at this. You oh. <laughs> somehow just the way you respond, even though when you're not asking questions, the way you respond to the things that I say is just very easy to talk to you. So no. keep it up. Well, thank you. Thank you. All right. Well, Paul Zascano, I appreciate you sitting down with me and, and talking out here on Gospel Tangents. Great. Keep up the good work, Rick. Thanks. I hope you enjoyed our conversation with Paul Toscano. Paul, thank you so much for sitting down with me. 
and uh, talking about the September 6th and that Mark Hoffman stuff was really interesting as well. So thanks again. In our next conversation, I'm excited to introduce Jerry Grover. He's a geologist and he has a book called Geology and the Book of Mormon. But I really didn't have any inklings to publish anything. I assumed, well, somebody else might, you know, some BYU professor or something. But really, nobody had done anything. And so I kind of thought, well, something that's really just been sitting out there with no research, as there are a lot of those topics. And and there's very few scientific um, approaches to the Book of Mormon, as I found out, you know, looking at a lot of people write books on doctrine and the text and translation techniques and all that, but very few people have actually really looked scientifically at the what's said in the Book of Mormon and what's indicated. And right. So that that's kind of my, at my, I have a website. It's basically dedicated. It's basically scientific and linguistic research. So that's really what I engage in. If you like what we're doing here on Gospel Tangents, please become a paid subscriber at gospeltangents.com or patreon.com slash gospeltangents. We've got full transcripts on our website at gospeltangents.com. And if you'd like to check out some of our other conversations, click over here. Thanks.